um, my name is Andrew Mohammed. I'm actually one of the Lost Founders members of One Direction, the music group, and they left me behind. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that is a joke. Uh, my name is Andrew <laughs> Mohammed. Uh, I teach Black History um, in the UK. Um, a lot of my workshops are music centered and movie centered. Plus, I'm also director of a young um, Leaders Academy in West London. Yes, hi. Thank so you. I'm Julian. I'm a singer songwriter. Um, I recently released um, a single about the George Floyd in, in um, support of the George Floyd protests called Silent Storm. Okay, I'm Will Sullivan. I'm the uh, race quality officer for the TUC. Um, work a lot with um, entertainment unions around issues of race. Then um, I, well, I've spent the past year doing a, doing a PhD. I'm looking at women's careers in the music in industry. I'm very interested in intersectionality. So I'm really interested in um, in women specifically who who are of uh, African, Asian, or minority ethnic heritage, because. Um, you know, we all know, we all know that that women are discriminated against in the music industry, but I think these um, these particular groups are, are even more so. So that's that's what I'm spending the next the next few years looking at. So really really interested in in this presentation Everybody, tonight. I'm delighted to be part of this evening's conversation. I'm a historian of Black cultures, Black Atlantic cultures. Um, someone who, in their um, writing as a critic about music mm -hmm. over the last sort of 40 years or so, a bit longer actually. Um, is really kind of committed to, uh, how can I put it, revealing the depth, humanity and complexity of, uh, of black popular musical forms in particular, and looking in detail at how they have changed this city and this nation. I'm Gordon. I'm a DJ, broadcaster, promoter, and my activities focus around the now and next generation of jazz musicians in London and beyond. Thank you very, very much. And uh, Camilla, if you could please unmute. Camilla. Thank yes. you. Hi. Hi there. I'm. Uh, Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Deputy General Counsel at PPL. Um, so PPL, uh, PPL, we represent um, record companies and performers and license their rights for public performance, broadcast and online use. Um, and I'm here with several of my other colleagues um, at PPL, I can see names up on the screen there, as part of a, a big group of us um, supporting the, the company's initiatives on you know, um, diversity, inclusion and equality. Um, so I'm really, really interested to hear the, the speeches today and thank you so much for the invite. I'm, I'm also, joined, also joined by my husband, Nick. Hi everybody, my name is Nick Eziofala. I'm Camilla. Hello. I'm also a partner in a law firm called Simkins. <clears throat> and we're a media and entertainment industry law firm yeah, for lots of people in the music industry. Um, I'm of mixed English and Nigerian heritage, and I also come from a background as an artist. Um, and under the artist name Essa, I've released various things, including a single um, that was about and in response to the murder of George Floyd called Justice, which came out just recently. I remember when I first studied law, saw the Stephen Lawrence case and how his murder was war, institutional racism. Um, my name is Dave Randall, I'm a musician and a writer. Um, I used to tour a lot with bands, some of them quite well known, and I produced music myself. On the writing side, um, I'm now the music editor of, of a local community paper here in Brixton, where I live. I'm the music uh, editor of the Brixton blog and Bugle. And I first met Quaku because I'm also the author of a book, Sound System, The Political Power of Music. So I've written quite a lot and spoken at a number of events about the ways in which music and politics converge, including, of course, the question of racism. So, so can I just say good evening, first of all, to everyone, particularly to our guests, also our special guests, and those that will be making presentations. So I'm mindful that some of the presenters would have to dash or so. I will play the video that puts some context and then I'll talk a little bit and then we'll go straight into the presentations. I think the only part that is regrettable, the most regrettable part is that, uh, that I got drunk. 
I got drunk. I got drunk in my teens, and then I became a studious musician, and I didn't drink. It's a really interesting period of my life when it was like between 18 and 25, when I was a scholar, and I tried to find out everything there was to know about jazz, about music in general, about the blues, about country blues, about folk. It all became uh, uh, my obsession. And then once I thought I'd, uh, I'd discovered all I could handle, I drank again. And that's the part, that part, it's like 20 years. Uh, of drinking, where I, you know, I did really offensive things. I was a nasty person, which I say in the movie, a nasty. You person. focus on an incident that you're yeah. often reminded about. Yeah. In which you say you were semi-racist. I mean, you yes. were racist on stage, yes. weren't you? Fully, ra full tilt. Yeah. 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 And words I, yeah. that we don't normally use on the radio, but words like wog, words yes. like coon. Yes. To describe the people you wanted to get out of the country. Yes. Well, I mean, I think it was based on the Arabic invasion, where um, I think as much as anything, it was about, what do they call it? This is the word for it. Uh, the foreigners, just foreign people, kind of thought, were they taking over the country? So, I mean, it's a simple-minded, working-class villager like me, uh, which is what a Brexit is all about, in a way. It's like you're getting, interviewing... Perceptions of pop music are such that black music taken to radio is seen as being a marginal area. Can I just say, but when you for the reason why I'm doing playing this and I'm playing some old stuff is this: when we did the Black Lives Matter, I'm sorry, Blackout Tuesday, the show must be paused. A lot of the people that I interviewed in the interview said one of the things they did was to read up on African history, read up on African biographies. Some were not aware of racism. JK said that. He thought racism was pretty much gone. So it's important to see where we've come from. And we're going to go a bit further because history is important. The first person to make a presentation is Jane. And she's from um, MMF. I think in July, they had one of their sessions where they looked at African history. And people were saying, in fact, over 100 people were in that meeting, they were saying, they didn't know, and they wanted more. So it's important to see some of the, both the African history and the music industry history, because let's face it, a lot of people in, in here may not have been around when these things were happening. We're talking about the, the, the 80s. The best guide to who the record industry really honours is the prestigious BPI Awards. Soul to Soul were passed over for the Best Newcomer Award, which was given to Lisa Stansfield a white singer of soul music. Rather than giving um, credit or respect, paying respects to the people that come up with an original idea, it's a bit like, right, now we've found a great white hope that can do this better than, or as well as they can, even if it's not as well as, but we can do something that's sort of like the real thing. Let's, but let's market them and put a lot of money behind them rather than like sticking behind um, the people that are out there slogging for us right now and doing really well and bringing in the bucks. What is so, so? The difficulty I think at the moment is that there's a very narrow band of people selecting what is the best pop music, which means that you do get underrepresentations of major areas of music because there's nobody in the Radio 1 production circles who really knows about them. You may be right because obviously if, if there are people if we're not, if we haven't got the right mix of people, then that is going to reflect on what goes on. I, I would accept that. Okay, this is where I'm going to do some narration, and as much as you rehearse, it may not work. But anyway, the main thing I start with this, which is the in music industry stakeholder universe. I contend that the music industry stakeholders are more than those that just get paid from music. 
So, June 2nd, the show must be paused. The first time I've seen mainstream music industry show allyship, solidarity with an African experience. The organizations both in the UK and the US supported this to the hilt. You saw them on, on their Twitter accounts uh, posting a lot of things. And that made them say, we're going to revive something called Remy, race equality in the music industry. We started a couple of years ago, we sort of faltered, but we said, okay, if you're in solidarity with uh, the Afrophobic death of George Floyd, then we're gonna to restart the conversations we had four or five years ago and see what you're doing about British, the, the music industry, particularly the African British community that produces black music. So that was the idea of us coming back and on June, sometime, June 30th, we had a conversation with, I think, 10 of the key music business organizations to ask them what was, what, what was their race, ethnicity facing programs. So uh, we ended up uh, releasing a report called the Remy Blackout Tuesday UK Music Industry Race Diversity Report that covered uh, a distillation of the conversations I had with organizations some of the stuff that we've done as Remy, so it gave some background and history of what we have done, and more importantly, where we go in terms of the latest information that, that we had. So I think this came out uh, sometime in, in July, and we thought, yeah, okay, how many people read reports? So this was a close conversation I had with the industry, or we had with the industry. Why don't we open up to that, what I talked about, the wider stakeholder community to find out what are these organizations that posted all this solidarity or uh, tweets doing to engage with racism, but more specifically Afrophobia, which is racism specifically directed at Africans or things African. So that was, was the idea for this uh, meeting. And obviously, uh, after Paul Guerrero is giving us a summation of our uh, was been covered through these videos, uh, we will get the music industry organizations to tell us what they are doing. Uh, I want to start with a guy called, and it's coming slowly, he's a NAM role model. We did a project in the 2000s it's called NAM role models, naming and role models. And one of the role models we had was this guy, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. In fact, I'm doing a PRS first program because they, they, they mark it African History Month. I don't do Black History Month, by the way. I do African History Month. So I'll be talking briefly on Samuel Curry Taylor. This was a superstar artist. Look, he even had groupies, ooh, I'm sorry, fans, who were desperate to get his autograph. We're talking about a superstar during the late 1900s into the early 20th century. This guy was so great that his music was performed at the Royal Albert Hall during the 20s and 30s to raise money for the Royal Choral Society, and yeah, and Royal, Royal, Royal Albert Hall. So uh, he, as big as he is, I, I don't know if you can read this. Normally I get Nana to read this. Nana, do you want to quickly read this whilst this is on the screen? Uh, I know you're in the house. I can't see you in the house, but I think Nana's in the house. If not, this was something uh, Samuel Kruger Taylor said, speaking to his... Okay, I can read it. Go ahead, go ahead quickly. No one realizes more than I that the colored people have not yet taken their place in the scheme of things. But to say that they will never, that they never will is arrogant rubbish and an insult to the God in whom they profess to believe. Personally, I know hundreds of men and women of Negro blood. Uh, sorry, I need to remove the... Um, yeah, I know. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I can't... Uh, of Negro yeah. blood who have already made their mark in the great world. And this is only the beginning. I might suggest that the pearly circle engaged <laughs> Not to worry, not to worry. Okay, so that was 1912, just before he died, and now we move it into the war years. Look, as early as 1943, the Americans came to the war, I think 1942, we had Jim Crow. They tried to uh, install Jim Crow on mainland Britain. So they had issues with both the African Americans and the British Africans, particularly from the Caribbean, the technicians. So there's a letter, 1944, uh, from the Ministry of Labor 
talking about the issues that were happening in terms of our racial fights between the white GIs and the Africans. They were bar trying to bar them from pubs, from dance halls, from hotels. So they couldn't boogie. Some people decided that, okay, uh, th these guys pay. So sorry, you Africans can't come in. And one pub said, you know what? Only the Africans are going to be allowed to come in. This is an issue that happened as early as 1925. Uh, when, uh, uh, what should I say, a guy who had a dancing place uh, was fined, and the issue was that people had the problem of seeing Africans and Europeans dancing together. That I think throughout the film, one of the things I would like us to discuss is what the limitations are of thinking about this in terms of personal problems. Clapton drinks too much, we need more individuals who are black in the record companies that will fix the problem. We don't want to personalize and individualize this. I think a hard thing, and it's wonderful there's so many people from the industry here tonight, is to think about it not in terms of the life or contributions of individuals only. Those things do matter, but they're not, I think, enough on their own. We need to be able to develop a different way of understanding this problem as a, as a process, as part of a system, as part of a structure. Someone in the film, it was Neil Fraser, said, mad professor said so clearly, you know, one of the stories we need to face is the fact that many people in this country love, love um, black music, but they don't necessarily embrace its creators and makers with the same enthusiasm. And I think that that's half the story. The other half is to say that, um, how can I put it? There are out and out racist people. Let's not be, let's not be, um, you know, mealy mouth about that. But there are also um, people who are part of systems, part of structures, part of processes, part of um, decision making machinery, who may not as individuals be racist at all. And yet the outcome of the decisions that are made, the outcome of the machinery they contribute to, the outcome of those systems and structures can be um, to intensify inequality, to shut the gate down, to close the window, and to cut the economic and cut the economic cord. So we, we're dealing not just with individuals, we can't just think about this as a matter of individual conduct and individual attitude. We have to find ways of talking about the structure, talking about the system, talking about the process, and that's important. Second thing, um, um, and this I suppose also goes back to Clapton too, he put his finger on it as a kind of, let's be generous for a moment and say a recovering racist, that's how he described himself. He put his finger on something which is really important, I thought. He said this, that in Britain, the question of racism is not really separable from problems of nationalism and problems of xenophobia. He linked the three things together. And I think uh, we should do that too. We should see that the way in which racism enters our lives, enters our institutions, enters our political process, our cultural industries, is really through that linking of racial feeling with nationalism and with xenophobia. And that's a, hard, that's a hard thing for people to swallow because it means that when people are um, uh, being, you know, I suppose what, what, we, what they want to tell us is exercising a kind of wholesome patriotism uh, in their views, in their conduct, that often that carries a kind of racial code. And for me, for me, this is really signaled in the notion of what it takes, not just to belong to Britain, not just to belong to England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland, although they have slightly different issues than the English do, but what it takes to be recognized as belonging to England. What does it take to be recognized as belonging to Britain? Great, thank you, Faku. Um, yeah, so um, at the Musicians' Union, we've had an equalities uh, official role for quite some time, quite a few years, but um, I've, I've been in my role since January. So a lot of the, the projects that I'm going to be talking about um, have been in the pipeline for some time. Um, some of them um, have gained a bit more traction this year due to the summer and George Floyd. Um, and it, it, we definitely found that some people who were previously perhaps um, a bit slower to get back to us on some things that we wanted to do have um, kind of become more aware actually about how pressing diversity in music is. Um, so that's, that's um, helped us 
Um, and so the, the first thing I want to talk about was that um, the, the Musicians' Union have industrial committees, uh, which are formed of members who are elected by the other members. Um, and these are focus groups for musicians that work in the different sectors of the music industry. So we've got a teacher's section, a recording and broadcasting section, live performance, music writers, orchestra and, and theatre. Um, and as we're a union, the democratic structure is that the, our members shape our union policy. So these sections um, discuss issues and they can make recommendations to the executive committee, which is also made of members who have been elected. Um, to, so they really drive the agenda, the campaigning agenda for the, for the EMU. Um, so we, we introduced a reserve seat structure on those committees to try and um, make sure that we had a representation from people, um, race, gender, sexuality, uh, disability, age, um, just to to try and improve the, and 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 kind of broaden out the kinds of issues that get brought to us that we can shape policy with. Um, um, so that's that um, in the, on the uh, our equalities committee that um, we had that was really successful. And all the other committees, um, we did get more um, more uh, nominations coming through. Um, but I think that's. Um, definitely something that's going to improve over time, especially as um, for uh, a lot of members who previously might have not felt that they um, there was space for them to to get elected onto these committees. They'll be uh, we'll be trying to show them and show them that we're trying to create change the culture of the the MU to be more inclusive. Um, so the, the second project we we created the um, an MU equalities policy. Um, so this sets out what's uh, to be expected of M the MU staff and our members um, and something that um, came through from the, the show must be paused was the need for accountability, um, especially beyond um, the show must be paused. Um, I think accountability is going to be key for taking um, all these new ideas and projects on forward and making sure that they're as meaningful as possible and that they reach an impact um, is, is, is as far and, uh, as possible. Um, so the, in, if it's part of that accountability process, uh, there's timelines um, and meetings where the members can, where we, where we update members on the progress that we've made on the projects that they've given us or worked with us um, on. Um, and we, we've also created um, diversity networks um, so we have a black members network um, and this is a, it's a collective space for our black members to discuss issues and work together um, and, and organize um, to put forward ideas and concerns to us as well so that we can act on that or shape, shape campaigns um, and to help our members uh, in a more focused way. Um, so we, we have an action plan. Can I just um, say that all the presenting organizations have been told it's at their discretion to produce a one or two page uh, file of a summary of what they're doing in this area. And remember, we're not looking at a broad area of diversity. REMI stands for race equality in the music industry. I know about intersectionalities and stuff, but we are focused on race and ethnicity. Uh, diversity or EDI uh, issues. So if you guys by the end of the week can send a one or two page PDF or doc file, we will make sure that it's circulated to uh, those that book. Obviously not everyone that, that booked is here, but it will go to everyone that booked. So on that note, can we say thank you to Rose? Stay as long as you can. But I think at this moment, I want to call Tom and Tom. Brilliant. Thank you, Kwaku. Um, and this is um, in some ways a double header as well with my colleague Rachel Bolland, who wasn't um, introduced at, earlier on. Rachel is our head of diversity and has been, that is a role which we have um, established at UK Music since about 2015. That's been a continuing era of our, our work where we, we kind of readjusted the, the, our, our working programme in, in relation to diversity and equality work. Um, there's several things I want to highlight first and then I'll bring Rachel in. Um, from, from, from our perspective, um, we observed the um, Blackout Tuesday um, uh, event and initiative. I mean, in terms of our own work as an organisation from a staffing level, we, we focused very much in terms of like um, how, how we as a, an organisation work, how any kind of preconceived barriers and in, 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 in systemic, uh, systematic 
issues that we kind of deal with, how we can kind of best address them and have greater awareness. So, so we're looking at in terms of staffing, like training needs that may be needed to be done in, in relation to greater awareness of racism and greater race, uh, awareness of diversity and quality issues. And that's something we're actively looking at and con continuing. And I think that's a positive thing that we, we are working on as a, as a staffing group uh, in relation to that, that work. Um, a big focus of, of our work at UK Music has been on the work of our UK Music Diversity Task Force. The task force itself brings together um, people from um, all aspects of the music industry um, at an employer level, but also at, a, at an individual level as, as well. And what the focus of that task force, which is chaired by Amo Tawa, who I think was on this call, but I think he may have left uh, left now. Um, the focus of that um, task force is very close focus on, on diversity generally, but in particular on, on, on race and, and also gender. And the work of that task force is, has been ongoing since 2015 too, in order to, to ensure that the industry is much more coordinated, uh, particularly in areas of entries into the, the music industry and also progression within the music industry. There are obviously some systematic barriers um, which uh, need to be broken in order to in, encourage and, and promote fair entry points and fair progression and through the collective work of doing a data gathering exercise which we conduct which informs these reports that gives us a better understanding of of the the immediate challenges the scope of actually the industry representation uh, is and how at different various different levels how difficult it is for people within certain um certain um, barriers through race or through gender how it, difficult it is for for progression this year's report, which is a biennial report, so it comes out every two years. This year's report will come out in October. Um, the primary focus of um, the kind of actions, if you like, coming out of that report is the development of a of a ten point plan, um, which we're finalising with members at this this moment in time. That ten point plan puts into course a series of actions that that we expect members and the industry to take in order to increase and, and develop diversity further. Um, one, for example, one of those um, areas we're going to cover is the eradication of the term fame, uh, as it's, uh, we feel it's discriminatory and, and doesn't reflect the, the situation, trying instead to use phrases more like black, Asian and minority ethnic as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a, a greater appreciation of the, the sheer diversity that, that exists out there. So that's going to be a central tenant of, of, of that 10 point plan. There are other um, areas which we which we're putting in place within that ten point plan to to encourage greater participation uh, uh, and greater understanding and awareness amongst our our our, our workforce as as, as well. Um, Rachel, is there anything further from your perspective that you would like to kind of add add on to that? Um, no, I think you probably covered uh, most of it. Um, I'll just add. Um, you know, we've had a lot of. Um, I say very frank conversations within the diversity task force this this year, um, kind of surrounding uh, events that have happened over the summer, um, and I think um, to kind of echo what Rose said, um, I took on the um, diversity role last November, and I've had more people reach out to me um, to have con have more conversations about in this area in the last three months than I did in the kind of six previous to that. I just I feel like. Um, since Blackout Tuesday, there has been uh, a real drive to uh, from people to educate themselves and to uh, not just kind of pay lip service um, and say, you know, we're going to do better, but to actually um, come up with some concrete actions that, that we can actually put into place to actually drive some real change, um, which I think has been encouraging and that's been echoed by a lot of, a lot of people on the task force and other people that I've spoken to about this. Um, but as Tom said, our diversity report will be coming out um, uh, in October um, and uh, we're looking at how we can develop our work uh, next year based on those 30 findings. 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, to, to kind of uh, understand maybe some of the reasons around those statistics and what can be done to improve them. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for having us. Sure. So for anyone who um, hasn't encountered the Music Managers Forum before, we are a trade body representing music managers predominantly in the UK, but we have some international members. Okay, um, you're a co-host. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much.
There we go. Um, Rightio. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, various kinds of music managers are members of our organization. So that might be artist managers, producer managers, songwriter managers. Um, in terms of what that looks like, it can be an individual managing a small grassroots band right up to the large management companies, management collectives, you name it, they're involved. Um, as an organization, we run training, education, regular online and previously in-person events. Um, we lobby, lobby at government level via UK Music, uh, the Council of Music Makers and directly and run leadership programs. We provide funding increasingly. That is something we do more since the COVID crisis. And most importantly, we facilitate a place for a community of managers to come together and support each other. Uh, today, I'm going to outline some of the things we have done and are doing to address racial inequality in the music industry, specifically amongst the management community. Um, and yes, I suppose I'll dive straight into it. So firstly, a very quick snapshot of what our membership looks like. Um, as of today, we have 985 total active members. Um, you can see our gender split there and our geography in terms of managers in Greater London and in the rest of the UK. Um, in terms of race and ethnicity, um, you can see that we have 28% of our managers from Black, Asian and other ethnic backgrounds. Um, nearly 6% are non-specified. And uh, something we're acutely aware of is the low level of Asian and Asian Brit British uh, managers. But um, I'm sharing this with you just to offer a little bit of context. And um, also we're in the process of switching our membership system. So um, we're moving to a more sophisticated system and we're hoping to start collecting more sophisticated data. So hopefully including things around genres, the number and types of acts that are managed, um, hopefully some aspects of social inclusion. Um, though we do have some of, some of this data from our, um, we published a report back in 2019 called Managing Expectations. Um, so some of the um, programs that we have in existence within the MMF are worth noting just because um, we feel that they um, embody aspects of diversity throughout it. So the Accelerator is a leadership and development program that we run alongside YouTube Music with Arts Council England and the Scottish Music Industry Association. And it's a leadership and development program that offers bursaries, training and support to a diverse range of music managers. Um, Amongst the participants, over 50% of them are from Black, Asian and ethnic backgrounds, 40% of them are female, and 50% of them are from outside of London. Um, this programme is now in its second year and it's looking ahead. We're uh, accepting applications for year three. Um, I suppose something important about this as well is that it has genres, managers looking after artists ranging from drill to metal to pop to contemporary classical. And there's a real emphasis on peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and really building these managers towards having independent businesses. Um, another aspect that's worth mentioning in terms of diversity is the MMF board. So in the last few years, uh, Annabella Coldrick, our ch chief exec, introduced board rotation, which has allowed some flexibility to bring the board to a 50-50 gender split. However, as you can see from um, the phenomenal report that Nadia Khan of uh, Women in Control published earlier this year, we have a lot of work to do in terms of uh, race and ethnicity. At present, we have three managers from uh, Black, Asian or ethnic backgrounds who are all male. And so there is a quite striking absence of Black females involved at board level. Um, we're trying to address this quite pointedly. I think having the flexibility at board level in that three seats come up every year will help us but we've been inviting new managers to come and observe board meetings to help, um, help those who haven't previously encountered what a board, how it works, um, help them understand the importance of it and why it'd be valuable to get in, involved. And we have uh, an upcoming unconscious bias session for the board to help strengthen their understanding of the importance of inclusive leadership and their ability to bring in new managers into the fold. Um, I suppose One most- One minute. Ah, okay. Uh, most significantly, something that we've done in light of Blackout Tuesday, the show must be paused, was establish MMF Unite, which is a program designed to explore um, 
racial inequality in the music industry, specifically amongst the management community. So our first event, you mentioned Kwaku, we had um, Mr. Tony Warner from Black History Walks talk to us about civil rights in the UK and the history of some amazing black musicians. We're probably one of the most visible because we are the artists. So I think we have a huge role to play. And I think, first of all, recognizing that was really key for us. And I think the, the other thing that we, we had to do following like a Tuesday was recognize that we're an organization, a small organization of five white Europeans, you know, so we are not very representative as a team. And we have to accept that we may get things wrong. We have to accept challenge and we have to be very open as an organization. And I think that was one of the key things that we, that we took on board at the beginning of all of this, because we were really um, determined that we were going to try and ingrain change and not see that moment pass without ingraining any change in our organization. So that was a really key, key thing for us, I think, at the beginning. Um, so we, we took Blackout Tuesday as a day to reflect as an organization, to reflect what we were actually doing actively and reflect on what our contribution, positive contribution could be and where we were failing. And um, we wanted to put we wanted to put some things in place that we could monitor uh, and actually measure our measure our successes and see where we were failing. So we already had some things in chain in train. So we'd already launched an ambassador program to to diversify in many different directions the representation of artists that we had, both in terms of ethnicity and race, but also in terms of age, in terms of gender, and and in all all directions. But um, particularly in, in race and ethnicity, our ambassador program was really a drive to diversify. Um, so that was already in train before Blackout Tuesday. Um, we, we have subsequently put in place quarterly away days to look at how we are, how we are um, operating and to understand how we're achieving against the targets that we're putting in place and whether we need to reassess the targets we put in place. Um, we have, we have written new policies around proactive approaches to representation across all of our groups. So rather than just taking a passive approach to inviting new members to our beat board or to our ambassador program or to our advocates, taking a much more proactive approach to ensure that we have a diverse range of candidates coming into those groups. Um, we're actually benchmarking now across all of the groups. So we look at how we're, how we're doing um, how we benchmark on a quarterly basis across all of the FAC artist groups. Um, and we developed a clear upfront diversity statement for our handbook and for our new arrivals um, at the FAC. We wrote a policy around recruitment and again about actively, actively recruiting in a way that ensures a very diverse field of candidates rather than being passive about this, really working to ensure that we are seeking candidates from as broad a background as is possible. Um, and we outlined explicitly that we will have diverse panels and events so that we will be, always be representative in our events that we do for our members and for our, our artist community. Um, we developed a reading list of books and documentaries and films for staff and, and that's now in the, the welcome handbook for anybody that joins the FAC. Um, and that handbook will also go to new board members, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, we launched FAC Insights. So that's a place where we have long form articles about the, um, the music industry and the society that shapes it. So actually Ammo has already contributed and Nadia um, from Women in Control, just pub we just published a piece from her on uh, Friday. Um, we also at the last board meeting have signed off new governance processes to, to improve our rotation for exactly the same reason as Jane was explaining to, in, to, in, it, to bring a more, uh, more opportunity for a diverse range of nominations to our board. And in, in line with that, we also have signed off an agreement to bring more observers onto our board as well to provide opportunity, experience, bring new knowledge and fresh knowledge to the board. Uh, and, and to broaden the, the sorts of topics that we're talking about. Uh, and then finally, I think we, we've been working very hard with UK Music as well and we've been very engaged with UK Music as we're one of the member organisations. 
So we'll be signing up to the 10 point plan, which was the reason for the order Kwaku. So that was why, that was why Tom, it made more sense for Tom to go first. So I think, um, I think that's about where I'll leave it for you because I'm conscious that you might shout one minute and minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Fantastic. Can I just say that the FAC was not one of the organizations that were able to interview for the Remy report, but I'm glad nevertheless the FAC found it uh, worthy to contribute to this particular forum. Very much. Um, as I said, I am the, the manager of um, equality, diversity and inclusion at the Ives Academy. Um, I was appointed last year, well this time last year really, on the back of um, a panel discussion at our AGM in 2019, which was remo removing barriers to inclusion in music, a discussion panel which um, was a, a good success and then momentum started uh, moving more rapidly and quickly and I was appointed to this position. Um, in terms of what our progress has, the progress that has been made, um, following uh, the murder of George Floyd this year, the IBIS team observed Blackout Tuesday on the 2nd of June, like several other music companies and organisations around the world. The IBIS team used this pause in our everyday working lives as a moment of internal reflection for our organisation on exactly what we mean when we say equality, diversity and inclusion. We discussed the question of how does, how does it and how should EDI agenda impact our working lives at the Academy. Following on from our team's discussion and with proactive support and assistance from our board, the team at the Ives Academy set out planning a new vision for our equality, diversity and inclusion policies at the Ives Academy. Our progress so far, the Ives Academy is a professional, is the professional home of music creators of all genres in the UK. We champion equality, diversity and inclusion, and this is fundamental to the Academy's work and has been over several years. However, recent progress includes um, publishing of a 12 point action plan, which is all on our website. Um, I probably will make that available as a PDF, but you can go to our website and see that there, which outline, outlines our objectives and priorities for the next two years. And this is, at, under constant review um, and also obviously creating my post, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Manager. Then we formed the Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Steering Group, which is a subgroup, a subcommittee of the Ives Academy Board. Our creator-led steering group is formed of members from the Academy and members of the committee and supplemented by other members and experts. As the steering group continues to grow and adapt to better reflect all aspects of diversity and inclusion. Its agenda must also respond to events and the intersectionality that comes from reflecting the diverse, diverse world that we know exists. The staying group's key role and function is to maintain the Academy's equality, diversity and inclusion policies. Other things that we have been up to are the launch of the Academy's Youth Network and the Youth Network Council for an engagement with the younger demographic of music creators and giving them the voice and learning from their experiences. We also launched uh, a discounted under 25 membership category, helping breaking down social and economic barriers to becoming a member of the Ives Academy for Young Creators, and appointing two of the members of the Youth Council to the board to share a joint directorship on the board of the Ives Academy. Working with Apple Music, um, we launched the Apple Music Rising Stars Award um, to target the under 25 demographic category and this has opened up um, a whole new um, tranche of um, either support for young rising stars um, and including that is a, a targeted um, uh, campaign to, to target young creators of all, all genres and all diverse backgrounds too. One minute, of, one minute. Okay, creation of an Ivers Academy bursary scheme which also helps break down social economic barriers to joining the Academy. We're also working on our, our data collection and are working to produce um, policies and documents regarding data collection for ethnicity and all the protected characteristics that are outlined by the government um, in the recent, uh, well, the, the census of 2001, I think it was. 
First of all, I will tell you what AIM is. So we are the Association of Independent Music and um, the organisation has been running for 20 years and it was founded by a group of um, very rebellious uh, record label executives who felt very much that they were outsiders in the industry um, for a lot of the reasons that uh, Kaku's film went through and um, they have continued to be um, very much in the corner of other outsiders and I'd say that's, uh, that's really at the heart of what AIM does. Can I interrupt to say you're now co-host? Okay, thank you Kwaku. So first of all, um, I thought it would be useful to show you where AIM finds itself and then I thought I would tell you a little bit about the future. So bear with me a second and I will try and make this work. Okay. There we go. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. Let's see if the sound works. If I give you my time and give you my space, no, then that's not to waste, yo. Still better know your place, yo. I ain't slept good in days, yo. I'm just running up pace, so we smoke too, right? You say so. I'm back on my. You ain't seen no one like me since Roman Hill back in the 90s. Feeling that stuff, yeah, I might be. Got a no soul when you know that, but the old ones make way for the 90s. Kid, yeah. please don't kill my high. I'm in mean, words, no stop, never tired, no. That girl is on fire, you know. Who stay bringing the vibes, you know? This is fine now. 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 This is fine Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to share, share that with you because uh, I'm very proud of it. And that was our latest independent music award. Oh, sorry. Bear with me a second. Sorry, I tried to play again. I was so excited to play the first time. Um, so, yeah, so I thought interesting to see, first of all, where we are in the spirit of Kwaku. Let's look at the history, let's look at where we got to. So, um, you know, AIM, I think, has um, social justice really at its heart. And um, the other thing that we, I'll tell you one thing we don't have, what we don't have is a head of diversity. Part of the reason we don't have a head of diversity is because we feel the whole organization should be heads of diversity. We are all accountable. We all need to make a difference. And that kind of brings me to my second point. So, you know, I can show you that video and I can talk to you about being proud of what we've already achieved. I don't think the industry is where I want it. I don't think even AIM is where I would want it or where the rest of the team would want it. And I don't think we really yet represent the vast community of people who are trying to make their own way as independent businesses in the music industry. Um, I was really, I was really minded of this when uh, Prof Gilroy was talking about uh, black people making their, baking their own recipe. I really like that partly because I like baking, but also because I think it's about making your own journey, making it for yourself. I think that's really at the heart of what AIM is about and what AIM does. Um, what we've done is rather than like a particular initiative here and a particular um, activity there, what we've done is we've really just looked at where are those communities that we want to be part of and that we think we need to represent because fundamentally we're an organization that represents people who are trying to run independent music businesses so it's not for us to be representative of them it's for us to represent them we've got to be them we've got to be in communities we've got to have all communities as part of us otherwise as you know we're just running the organization we're not doing our jobs if we're not properly representative of independent music. So what we've done the whole way through our 20 year history is try to do that. So try to find people who are underrepresented, try and give them voices, try and show their faces, try and make sure they're out there and they're heard and they're encouraging other people to come and join us and join in what, as you can see from that video, is really a fantastic party, but also a fantastic organization to be part of. All I'm gonna say is that all those organizations need to work together that's why we've got UK Music. We work together with UK Music on their Diversity Task Force. 
We're also working with our European partners at a group called Impala, which is for the European uh, independent uh, labels and rights holders. I'm Ben Winter. I'm Grants and Programmes Manager for the PRS Foundation. Um, the PRS Foundation is very much about quality and we believe that everybody should be uh, seen and should be treated in the same way, be it regardless of race, gender, sexuality, you know, everybody should be treated fairly and in the same way and in the same manner and with the same amount of respect. As such, following the events of Blackout Tuesday, we made a statement in support of the black community um, and that whilst the foundation itself has made its own mistakes internally, looking inside, um, we discussed the uh, amount of black executives and you know, these are things that we have to address within our own organization. Um, and also mistakes that may have been made in the past. Um, the foundation has said that they're not beyond being approached to discuss ways in which that they can improve and want to improve. So, you know, it was a very positive message that went out, um, one in solidarity, but also one to take ownership and to state where improvements can be made. Um, as a result of that, in the short term, we then launched the third round of our Sustaining Creativity Fund and having noticed that there was a downturn in black applicants um, compared to the usual number of applicants that we'd received from the black community for our various funds, we decided alongside our partner Spotify to ensure that the third and final round of our sustaining creativity fund would be exclusively for black talent. Um, that fund was to help sustain creators to be able to create during the lockdown pandemic. Um, and that third round was crucial to making that happen. So we partnered with a number of black led organizations to help the foundation to reach different audiences different types of black audiences, both regionally um, in terms of genre and in terms of gender. So, you know, as well as making sure that we were reaching out to the black community, we were also ensuring that the intersectionality was, was not something that we bypassed. Um, since the Sustaining Creativity Fund, where we managed to support over 53, um, black creators we have been working on a long-term program which we hope will help to shift the the culture within the british music industry where there is some well not even some where there is um a lot of institutional racism or prejudice um and we've been working on a program which we shall be announcing in November, which we hope will power up the talent, both creators and executives within the black community, within the British music industry. So these are key things that the PRS Foundation have been working on since Blackout Tuesday in order to ensure that we are providing a better service to those that are coming for funding, but also to ensure that we are playing our part to create a, a fairer and more just UK music industry and UK music industry seen from emerging talent all the way through to superstar talent and behind the scenes talent, which, can, which is something that often gets forgotten about and isn't discussed, ensuring that the managers and the executives that happen to be black are also getting opportunities and receiving support in the same way that some of the um, performing black talent can get that support. So we've been working really hard on that and, and a lot more will be revealed in time. I can't go into too much detail about that program that is being designed to power up black executives and black creators um, at this moment in time, but it will be announced in November and it will be launched in the beginning of 2021. So we really hope that that will make a massive difference and help to shift the way that the industry has been working and will work in the future. Um, and we've partnered up with various organizations that are black led, including um, 
the Black Music Coalition um, and various others that, that, again, I can't announce, but yeah, it's going to be amazing to watch this space. Hello, I'm Lucy from the Music Publishers Association. We represent the music publishing community of the UK, um, from the small independents to the major publishers. I'd like to thank you for welcoming us into this very important conversation about change for racial equality in the music industry. This year, events in the US caused social, collective and industry-wide reflection on the equality or lack of in our industry. It's a reflection of our society, but important to reflect on that where we work. The MPA has seized this moment, collectively, I should add, across its board, its community, to really look at how we are structured, who has opportunities, and how we can redress where there is imbalance. In this light, we are looking at a very holistic, lasting, and materially changing response. That includes looking at our entire structure, our governance, our strategy, our employment, the way we work as a business, as a group of three businesses, and indeed show leadership for the music publishing community at large. For this, we need extra expertise. We need more perspectives and opinions than we currently have. We are very aware of this and working to include all of the knowledge that we need and all of the right perspectives that we need to include to change. We are encouraging all of our decision-making bodies to reflect similarly, to think about who gets to positions of authority and the different faces, perspectives and opinions that we need around a truly inclusive decision-making table. Alongside that, material change starts from the ground up too. And in that light, everything that we do is woven in with an ethos of equality, representation and improvement. This goes from career entry, where we have uh, youth membership open to everybody, but a particular scholarship program focusing on access to the music industry for black and minority young professionals. This progresses into a mentoring scheme, Mentoring for Progress, again, Working with partners, we're already working with Small Green Shoots and My Runway to provide 10 mentoring places specifically for black and minority young professionals, but to progress their careers. We're looking at who gets to positions of authority and want to support a wider group getting to the top. We also know that this needs to progress right through uh, our careers. So again, we're weaving the ethos of this into everything that we do. That means that the way that we um, manage our board, the way that we look at nominations, who is included in our candidates for employment and how we approach all of those things. The final piece I suppose is visibility. We firmly believe in and we recognize that the industry doesn't look the shape that is familiar to many young people. We want to raise those voices, those profiles, those faces that might resonate with more people than they might on the surface see as their home in the music industry. Through blogs, through communications, through other speakers in our events, through our courses, everything that we do will take reflection on who is speaking, who has voice, and the diversity and inclusivity that we present as an organization and as we present as a community. It's really important to the MPA that diversity and inclusion isn't just a panel topic or a moment in time. It's done separately ruins the point, ruins the material prospect of change, and it undermines our intentions. Diversity and inclusion is at the heart of the MPA's ambition, and so it will be woven into everything we do and the way that we present ourselves to the industry and the world at large. Thank you for supporting us on this journey, this important time in all of our lives. And we look forward to collaborating, to communicating, and to the future of a more diverse and inclusive music industry. Thank you. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm MJ O'Larry, and I work at the BPI. Um, I'm proud to say that I sit on the board at BPI, and I'm mostly also involved with the UK Music Diversity Task Force. So, you know, a lot of things happened this year and, you know, Blackout Tuesday was a very, very big day and it was a, a, a big step 
that the music industry took. We felt very much at the BPI that that was um, great. It was a very demonstrative um, action to take and it prompted a lot of talking on the back of it. But what we really wanted was some real concrete action to come out of it and not just talking. And I think, I think maybe one of the things, because it was such a vibrant public demonstration, I think it, it emboldened a lot of people to say, do you know what? Now we're really going to go for this because you've gone out there, you've put yourself out there. Um, now follow up, follow up on it. So um, just, you know, BPI are a trade body for UK recorded music industry. We've got Universal, Sony and Warner and about 400 other um, independent uh, music labels as well. Uh, put it into context, we also run the Brit Awards. So it was quite interesting to uh, hear a bit on that earlier on. And the Mercury Prize, which of course, uh, we, you know, got, got us a great result at the tail end of last week. So what have we been doing uh, with the, at the BPI on the back of this? Um, we felt we had to do some stuff and we felt that there was every possibility that we might do some things that weren't great, that we might get things wrong, but we put our hand up and say, I'm sorry, we'll do better next time, but we just want to do something. So one of the first things that we did was we now have a BPI, very long-winded this, BPI Equality and Justice Advisory Group, we, known as EJAG. This was effectively repurposing the group that looked at the Brit Awards um, two, three, four years ago um, and all the work that was done that. Um, EJAG has got a purpose, which is to work collaboratively and progressively, to advocate and push for positive change and representation across the sector with an initial focus on race and gender for the benefit of the music industry and its current and future workforce at all levels. So EJAG is chaired by Jed Doherty, and we've got deputy chairs of Paulette Long and Kwame Kwatem on it. It's comprised of diverse members of the industry, plus the internal BPI diversity group. So this group has been meeting um, initially weekly, now every two weeks, um, because everybody is volunteers on, on here. And we've been looking at some longer term strategy initiatives that um, they feel that the BPI should get behind. And one of the most useful things that we've um, uh, we've managed to do so far is that whenever there's been um, issues where we've been questioned on, they found a great, really good sounding board uh, for Jeff Taylor, our CEO, to really discuss these matters so that it's not, you know, another middle-aged white man talking about race issues. So that's been absolutely brilliant. So if we talk about the, um, the internal diversity group, what have we been doing there? Well, we, we've launched a BPI equality training program and we've had two sessions so far. The first one, we had a workshop on the 27th of July. Um, we had just shy of 150 people that, um, attend that. Um, this was a workshop um, hosted by uh, Paulette and Kate at PPL. It was a workshop on recruitment called Diversity in the Ranks. Really to start the conversation going and the ball rolling in terms of how do you address diversity within your company? So. Our, this was aimed at our staff, um, uh, AIM staff as well, uh, some of our key contractors, because it's really important that the people you do business with are also part of this journey, and of course our members as well, because we're very, very conscious of the fact that a lot of people want to do things, but they don't know how to or where to start. We had our second session um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, an open conversation, let's talk about race. That was a great session because often that's the stumbling block. How do you talk about race? And that was wonderfully um, hosted for us by uh, Dr. Joanna Abeyi. Uh, and we had some really interesting things come out of this. One of the other things we're doing is that we've got feedback um, on all of the sessions that we do and asking people openly, what do you want to know? What do you want us to do? So we've got two more planned uh, for this year, one on inclusive environment, so including unconscious bias and microaggression, because there's no point in recruiting and then having a hostile environment for people to work in, because, you know, whether that's knowingly hostile or unknowingly, because you're not going to hang on to people. And then we're also going to do another uh, session on career progression. So great, you've got this uh, inclusive environment, you've got uh, your recruitment processes in place such that you've got a broader pool of people that you pull in. But what do you then do? What are you looking for to make sure 
that those people that are developing and moving on into senior roles within your organization. So that's the program that we've had this year. We're um, always looking to see what we're going to carry on doing. Uh, we're planning on having a very busy time next year. Uh, we've talked about uh, the UK music has had um, uh, some great billing. Absolutely right. We need to work with this together. So we feed into UK music as well. And some other things that we are looking at within the BPI is uh, mentoring. Uh, that's come up really quite a lot. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that we take account of what's out there and what other organizations are doing to see whether we can partner with them. Uh, we're also having um, a look at perhaps some leadership programs to make sure that people as part of their education in leadership are aware of diversity issues, um, whether that's race, gender, the whole thing, because, you know, in this day and age, you have got to be an educated leader in your organization in, in all of these matters. And then lastly, uh, we're looking at schools and education. So not only about the educational aspect of, uh, of black music history within the UK, but also the fact that there are other careers in the music industry rather than just behind the mic. And just to try and let people be aware of what, of what the options are and actually what the breadth of skills that you could need to do that on. So, you know, just rounding everything off and within the BPI as an organization itself, um, we really feel as well that it's, we need to be an anti-racist company and it is the responsibility of all employees to make sure that that happens and not just a group here or an individual there. I'm normally responsible for diversity within the organization, but you have to have everybody owning this and having a feeling of responsibility to make sure that you push this forward because otherwise you will still be left with pockets within your organization where, you know, bad habits will persist. That's it. Thanks a lot, MJ. Can I, I think I'm a bit free with MJ to say this. And I heard MJ say something like, lastly or something, the way she said it was like, oh, I hope Kwaku is not going to say one minute or 30 <laughs> seconds more. Poor girl, poor girl. She was hoping I wasn't going to bat in. I could feel that in your voice. Can I just say, you mentioned that you've been polling your members because you want to hear from them. Can I say one of the organizations that we interview that isn't represented here today are doing just that. I saw their Twitter feed, that's PRS for Music, and it says members we want to hear from you to help us shape our diversity and inclusion approach and strategy. We are hosting online member listening circles for you to share your thoughts, experiences, and ideas. Get more info and register at your whatever. Uh, there's a URL so you can, you can check it out on their Twitter feed. So if you're a PRS member, it's incumbent to you to be part of that conversation. So uh, MJ, you did a fantastic job. I have to be honest, I do think in terms of the organizations, uh, uh, BPR is quite ahead of the curve because people are from ground zero to, to, to wherever. Someone asked me how many presenters. We finished it off, uh, the official presentation, but there were one or two people that were special guests, and I want them to have just one minute because they can add, especially if either from the musician or industry uh, section. The key thing for home musicians is um, uh, our, our focus obviously is on musicians rather than industry and our focus is on um, practical action more than campaigning. Um, we know we've still got more to do in terms of represent representation at board level and representation at senior staff level, um, although there, there has been progress made in, in recent years. Um, some things we're really proud of, um, we, this year we've had the, the fourth year of our MOBO partnership and this was the, the biggest fund ever. Um, and in fact, you know, going, going as far back as um, the 80s and 90s, um, I can see in our records that we were helping musicians, for example, um, Erilyn Wallen, who uh, did the new version of Jerusalem at the proms this year, was one of uh, the beneficiaries in her early stages. So I think the key thing for us is, is how we shape our creative program in particular to, to make sure that it actively breaks down barriers um, uh, as opposed to just um, you know, uh, supporting those people who have already found access relatively easy. Um, actually, one of the most fundamental things we did last year was, was on the classical side, where for, for years and years, access to our postgrad funding was 
um, effectively had to be endorsed by the conservatoires. And last year we changed that and allowed anybody to apply if they felt they were good enough. Um, and that transforms um, the makeup of who applied and therefore who received funding. And I think there's a lot more we can do to make sure that the money we put in uh, really does uh, reach everybody and knock down those barriers. So plenty more work to do for us, but we're actually quite excited by the challenge. And, Thank you very um, much. I'll tell you more in the coming months about the, the next big things we've got planned. Thank you very much, James. Uh, so basically, if I did invite you, then you could be put on the spot. But as I said, it's, there's no obligation to talk if you don't want to talk. Uh, yeah, very quickly. I mean, I'll, I won't go into all the TUC is, is doing, though one of the things I will say, we are setting up a task group both to look at what's what we're doing internally and what we need to do better in terms of representing uh, black workers out there more generally. Uh, just specifically on the music industry, I mean, obviously one of the things I've been doing is doing stuff around entertainment for a long time with some of the unions. And there's two things that I'd say, well, three things that I'll say very quickly. One is, you know, we've been pushing the need for monitoring in the industry because if people uh, haven't got, you know, if we haven't got the evidence and that's not open, then nothing will change. Secondly, um, one of the things, not just in this industry, but more generally, I've been saying is that we have to get away from a deficit model, which is somehow that there are all black people out there who experience and can't do jobs and somehow they need mentoring and leadership to get in. Uh, we have to understand that the, the nature of all industries is discriminatory against black people in the first place. Lastly, uh, one of the things that sort of um, the pandemic stopped me doing really was actually doing more work put in Ofcom as a regulator under pressure to fulfill their responsibilities in this area because they have got responsibilities in this area and they've let that community uh, down badly in the past. I only need to talk about what happened to Choice FM for people to understand what I'm saying. Right. Thank you, Wolf. Thank you, Wolf. And I can see Dave on camera, so hopefully he can now turn on his microphone. And, as said... and throughout history of music and politics converging. Um, thanks for asking me to, to talk a bit more about that. Could I just add to the discussion that I think it's been a very useful discussion this evening. Most of it has focused on representation and diversity in organisations. And of course, those things are very, very important. But I think that we must avoid making the mistake of believing that, um, that organisations will automatically become anti-racist if you just get those things right. I think the discussion has to go beyond that. To, to quote the African-American academic Cornell West, he was interviewed and referred back to the Obama presidency. And his comment was, it's not enough to have black faces in high places. That was his phrase. Uh, it's a question of politics too. And therefore, I'm very pleased that Paul Gilroy kicked us off with some thoughts about the systemic roots of racism. So I think that um, this has been a very good discussion. I hope that future discussions can perhaps open out and we can include some people from activist groups, uh, activist groups like Black Lives Matter, like Love Music, Hate Racism and so on. And we can talk about how we can empower people um, in the industry, artists and others to call out racism, not only within the industry, but outside of it. Um, what, what sort of tools we can use in order to make sure that music is a weapon, is an anti-racist weapon. So there's all sorts of ways in which that has happened historically, including boycotts. So I think that in terms of uh, changing organisations within the industry, this has been very good, but I hope that this, the, the discussion in future meetings can become broader and we can look at this political question of where racism comes from and how we can be part of the solution. Right, thanks a lot Dave for that. Dave, I don't know if you remember, but when we started Remy, an addition was BAR. BAR stands for British Artists Against Racism. So whilst REM is very much focused on racism, but from an Afghanist uh, perspective, because racism impacts on different, uh, what should I say, uh, ethnicities, but we focus on, on, on people of Afghan her her heritage. Uh, BAR is supposed to be for any artist, British artist, who is proud to wear his uh, or her anti-racism thing on, on their shoulder. Can I just say, please look at the Remy report. There's a quote by, I think, a Korean 
that's speaking to racism and it's fantastic. So I've quoted that on this section of Bar. So I, 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 I rubbed you in uh, for Bar, which is British Artists Against Racism. And I, I like the confidence you've given. We're a small organization for the next meeting. Gosh, hopefully, yeah, if we have a next meeting, I'm quite happy for us to talk and frame it around what, what you, you, you said. I see Vic is in the room. Vic also was her document. Vic, can you unmute yourself? Her document was featured in that video I did because she was at the launch of one of the Remy events. And I thought her document would look at our uh, diversity, ethnicity and author was not given uh, the, 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 the time it needed, but I think the music industry wasn't at the place to do serious diversity. I think gender they can do, but when it comes to others, particularly ethnicity, it's a bit difficult. But I'm, I'm saying, I'm sorry George Floyd died, and I just said that in the report, but the legacy is the openness to now talk frankly and unequivocally about racism. I'm, hearing, I'm seeing Europeans talking about white uh, what is it, privilege and all that kind of stuff. So maybe, Vic, if your document had come out this time, it would have had a different reception. But can you remind us of your book and then take it from any aspect? Hi. Um, yeah, so my research, which I started 10, 10 years ago and published in, in 2011, it was my, um, my MBA dissertation. And I did it um, for an organisation that was then called the Alliance for Diversity in Music and Media, um, of which Keith Harris and, and, uh, and Remy Harris were, were, were part of, Paulette Long, I think, as well. Um, and I looked at attitudes towards equality and diversity from uh, companies and organizations in the music industry. So I did a big survey. Um, and actually, it was really difficult to get people to, to respond to that survey. Even lots of, lots of people were, you know, writing, saying to me, well, I'm not going to tell you what I think <laughs> about equality and diversity. So I think 10 years ago, we really were in, an, in another place. You know, people didn't even want to have that conversation. Um, but what I did manage to find, to find in, in, in that process was it all comes from the leadership. So, the, you know, the people who, who are running the organisations, whether, whether that's boards or, or just single managing directors, they, you know, the, their attitudes really set the tone. And the, and the organisations where the leadership were, were very supportive, very open to issues of equality and diversity, their companies were more diverse. So, you know, there was a, there was a, a, a real link there. Um, yeah, I don't know, you know, if it, um, if it really got a lot of traction or if, if a lot of people are aware of, of that research I did. I certainly know you were and, and uh, you know, and I, I was very grateful to come, come present it at, at one of your events. And that certainly started me on my path of doing, of doing more, more research, commissioning research um, uh, at, at what was then uh, BASCO, is now, is now Ivers Academy, and, uh, and my own so, journey um, now doing... It's quite a challenge to summarise what was um, 26,000 words about the last decade of uh, music press within dance music, dance music being um, coming from um, black communities in the US, uh, primarily from Detroit Techno to Chicago House. Uh, I'm sorry if my camera's gone. Um, yeah, and how basically it got ignored on the doorsteps of these UK publications. Um, I'm wondering, yeah, just really decimating the last decade of their coverage, going like into specific individuals who are at editorial positions and how they committed black erasure, going into how like um, uh, black innovations are always displayed through um, white artists or celebrated via white artists. There's a good example there of when a, um, a prominent white DJ called Ben UFO plays at a night and he plays a jungle set, which is a, a, a music very much foundations in the black and working class in the UK. Um, and he plays it with like three other black DJs on that night, but only his mix is the one that gets recorded and put out and then celebrated in the end of year results of what was the best um, kind of mix of that year. Uh, it goes into loads of other very specific issues. It's very long, 
Uh, Look, I will just... give everyone the link. I think that's the best way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, um, Rush. Sorry, go well. ahead. Uh, um, yeah, it also offers proposals as well on uh, how to do better um, and more big picture ideas about using data analysis um, to uh, discover blind spots in reporting. Um, and something, I think the biggest lesson I took away from all of the research and something that I continue to learn today is that uh, British society is deeply segregated and it's more segregated in ways that we can ever imagine. And that's something really important to understand in every decision that we make about how we think we can maybe fix this problem. Always remember it is more segregated than you think it is. And you're never actually gonna reach the people who you want to be reaching. Um, because of the way our society works. And you have to make a really massive concerted effort if you want to reach those people. Okay, um, let's yeah. go there, Rosh. Thanks a lot. And a Rosh. word that Nano introduced me to, epistemicide. That is the ratio of knowledge that uh, Rosh, you, you did mention. So that does happen. And uh, Paul Guerrero was talking about the work that I do. That is why I make an effort to bring out our histories. So here we go. So can you hear me now? Been standing here watching people pass like they can't see me now When I'm trying to get hope back in my heart but I just don't know how Somebody please that we have done to you is that the kind of role that you and him want to pursue 
And why'd you see us differently when we're the same as you? The color of our skin is the main reason that you shoot, yeah I'm tired of all the pain and all the wrecking What do we have to do so you can understand this message? What do we have to prove and don't you keep us second guessing, yeah Guess being black is a curse and a blessing We're only human after all But you're still kidding, we rise and fall And still we get no justice we've been fighting for It's like no one listens till there is another cause Yeah, we're only human after all, but you're still shooting, we rise and fall And what's it gonna take for you to understand That you just can't keep killing all our black men Give us all the reasons so that we can help you out I'm done with all the questions and I don't have any doubt The fool of feeling safe even when you're in your house I feel I'm sorry, I'm just going to see me home I can't breathe, scream at the top of my lungs. I can't speak. My thoughts are accelerating the rate of my heartbeat. Officer, can't you see that I'm shaking my arms, feet? Manual strangulations, my fate, and I'm gasping. Hate and discriminate, cause I'm labeled the dark skin. If you ain't pale in the face, then you basically are seen as incriminated. The paper's the place I was last seen. Cut the oxygen up to my brain. Chance slim. I can't breathe, can you hear me? I can't breathe. I need some air and I'm starting to wheeze. I'm in fear when your arms squeezing me. Calm down, please. The little life that I have left in your palm region. I'm speaking, I can't reach him. He's acting like he ain't receiving me, begging and pleading. Every second brings me closer to death. The pressure is peaking. White supremacist pessimists with prejudice feelings. This is what terrorism is if you never have seen it. What will it cost to solve this injustice across the globe? I'm disgusted. I've lost my focus. I'm flustered and claustrophobic. It's like they punch my throat and I feel like my lungs are full They can't give this my undevoted detention I've come to notice Black America, why do I feel like you get priority over everyone? Do you think we're inferior? Where in your mind? Do lives mean less? Hair in your eyes We're marked up and we're shot dead Where were you guys? So my name is Paul Fletcher. I'm the CEO of a company called Charanga. We are a music education platform. Um, we've been around for 20 years, concentrating on use of technology for music education. We currently uh, um, provide resources for around about half of the primary schools in the UK. Um, we're now in the middle of um, a kind of a, um, a little bit of navel gazing about our own diversity policy and how that relates to our own curriculum. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I, I maybe didn't make myself clear. What I was saying was that as a, as a teenager, like 40 years ago, um, I naively thought that by this stage, by 2020, it would be racism would be a thing of the past. And, you know, I was really disappointed to see that, you know, not only is it a thing of the past, it, it seems to be 
unfortunately on the rise. I, I mean, I'm not sure whether it's a minority becoming more vocal or whether it is gen generally on the rise, but it's obviously obviously more in the news. And it's, um, it, it's, a, very sad, it's a very sad thing, really, in this day and age. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's what in, in obviously inspired me to, to write the song and do my bit in a, in a very small way. You know, as a as a privileged white guy, I, I can't really, I can't honestly understand the issues. But you know, the best thing that I can do is um, is try and give a voice to the people who can and do understand the issues. Um, so yeah, there we go. Okay, that's cool. Well, in recent months, we've heard the word allyship, so that is one of the boats people can sail in. So Nana. If you do your uh, uh, summation, that may preempt some questions that might have been coming. And then it's for people to either make a comment or a question. I noticed some of the presenters are still in the room, so maybe if they needed to respond directly to something and they're available, they, they will. So Nana, do a quick, no more than two minute summation and then give it to the audience. Okay, I don't think I can give, uh, I can give it justice in terms of summation. But I think in a, a sort of response to Julian, in a sense, um, I think character Scott King, and she has been quoted in African Voices. And it's a very good, she said, struggle is a never ending uh, struggle. We win it and earn it in every generation. I think most of us would love things to be over. We would love it to be, there'll be no more racism. And I think that's where Trevor Phillips comes from with his, oh, we are in a post-racial society. In a sense, it's a bit like what's come in the news in the sense that it seems this government doesn't want anybody to talk about capitalism. And yet, if you don't talk about capitalism, you're not talking about one of the basic, uh, or, or how would I say, one of the main drivers of the racism that we're living with. So we need to sort of understand the mechanics of it. Structural racism doesn't live in a vacuum. Um, institutional racism is part of, the system evolved for a reason. Growing up, I remember we were taught about Les Savants, and it was because I was in Geneva, and they were talking about, and Les Savants were African people they had in French courts, because it was accepted then that if you want wisdom, you went down the Nile, you went to Africa. That's where wisdom came from. That's where the Greeks got their wisdom. In the last 400, 500 years, we have erased that. We have dehumanized Africans, and Africans have been non-people. So with the US and their three-fifths of a human being, in a sense, it kind of, I'm bringing in things that maybe we didn't um, talk about because the That's music fine. industry is powerful, but it needs us to understand where it's coming from. Racism is important. So at this point, if either the presenters or anybody wants to make a comment or ask a question, I'll, uh, if you indicate either by raising your hand physically or using the um electronic. electronic hand i will call you and then we can have a discussion thank you evening. i just wanted to say because it was really nice to see all the people who are doing things to improve diversity and um, but as a person who was a token ethnic in a big media company 20 years ago where they planned to have diversity drives and they really meant it. I am a bit cynical. I love it that people are doing things, but at the same time, uh, the term diversity gets used as something which is, is kind of slightly negative. And I would like it if there was an initiative that treated an illness called empireitis, because until you treat the people with empireitis with their terminal illness, then you're not going to be able to tackle the lack of diversity in companies. So my question would be to a thank you as well as a question. When people have these diversity initiatives, a few of the people have gone from the Zoom, but I would have asked them the question, what are they doing to recalibrate the minds of those who are in the boardrooms to work out what they're actually doing wrong? Do you see what I mean? And it, I'm, yeah. I'm saying because I've been in the business 20 years, I am one of those token ethnics. That, but thank you. I, I, lo I love you, Kwaku and Nana. Right, I thank will you. jump in there, Nana, to say, first of all, Joan, the empiritis, was that a, a word you coined? She's saying yes, because yeah. I'm used, I, I don't know what's I'm happening. I'm working out the cure now. I'm working it out now. Go okay. Do 
No, that's a fantastic word because I'm used to coining words. One which I introduced you guys to recently was Afri victimized syndrome. So it's nice to see you coin that word. Now, sometime we'll, we'll get a definition for it, but it's fantastic. So, you know, you've asked a question, and since we've got some of the presenters in the room, such as uh, Tom, for example, Tom, can you respond to, to the question uh, that Joan, Joan, Joan uh, put out? Or Sorry, what's that? Okay. Could you... Well, could, you just repeat, day, we... could you just repeat the question for Tom and whoever else? Okay, basically the, the question is, um, it sounds wonderful that the industry is doing a lot, but um, the cynics amongst us are wondering whether it's just a token, uh, a publicity stunt, which doesn't really go far. So how will you convince us that this is something that is actually going to have legs? Uh, that sure. also, also looking at the minds of those creating these diversity things to do with their own empireitis. Sure. No, I mean, I can certainly, I mean, certainly we tokenistic act, act, um, activities, um, certainly that type of thing, we certainly don't want to be associated with. I can understand that there will be um, some skepticism about trade associations uh, organizing and doing things like this in, in, in such a way, particularly with what's gone on in, in, in the past and not seeing action and, and concrete um, proposal. I mean, obviously we will be judged on the actions that we take as organizations and, um, and obviously held to account by, by the communities and, and, and individuals who make up the, the sector as to whether we are doing enough. We're trying. I mean, I think, I, I hope that those who are on the, on the, the, the meeting still would, would, would appreciate that we are going to efforts and that there's, uh, is to, to actually achieve something and I mean said so the 10 point plan when we when we launched that that is very targeted at specific milestones being reached within certain time frames very um, centered on that so there will be certainly there'll be information that you'll be able to uh, attribute to us there will be regular reporting on what's been done and so hopefully it'll be a much more transparent process I think in terms but I can certainly agree and understand the the, the potential skepticism because of what's what's happened maybe in the past but there is certainly a willingness to do something now so i hope at least um people will get behind the sector and those organizations who are trying to make the situation better thank you thank you tom i'll make two comments and then jane is in the house so jane for mmf if you can think about a response to that question can i just say two things first for one of the organizations we interviewed uh as the mpa music publishers association and both Paul and uh, Roberto wanted to come, but since last week they told me they were ill, and as of today, uh, Paul was certainly still uh, ill, so it's a shame that he couldn't make it. And there's a shame that Lucille, who at the last moment, and I mean today, stepped in, had to leave, but I will get her, her input. Yeah. But lastly, a comment uh, to, to Tom's response. You talked about going to the community. I hope you saw the, 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 uh, what should I say, the chat that I did, the stakeholders chat. The community is bigger than uh, the organizations and the music, U UK music. For example, Nana is part of an African com uh, or, or community organization. She is part of the community that what you do affects and they should have a legitimacy to challenge or to comment. And also, not an adversar adversarial thing, we might be able to make some suggestions to move forward some of the things you're doing. That's why I wanted a wider co uh, communication uh, discussion than just the same old, same old music industry type things. So, Nana, I don't know who's next. Yeah, I would like uh, maybe G and then Jane to comment oh, yeah, on... Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad they are. And uh, I just tell Jane... Uh, 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 well, uh, G, if you can please um, maybe respond to Joan's comment and maybe a bit of reassurance. The community uh -huh. in is rooting for you. I'll have a go. So I think um, the comment was really about um, things that go beyond um, tokenistic activities. And I think it is hard for a lot of organisations, you know, and I'm not making excuses for, for, for people, but um, maybe I am, I don't mean to, but um, a lot of organisations, a lot of people in these organisations have actually come to them from, you know, a desire to make real change and a desire to make the world better. And particularly when you're looking at some of the artist organisations, you know, all, all of these are representative organisations and, you know, they can only 
represent the people who, who, who are out there who come to, to join in. So it can be really hard for these organizations to know who they're not representing and to respond to the things that they want. So what I would say is, you know, get in there and make your voices heard. I think that's actually really important. I think that's the way to drive real change. Um, you know, I think a lot of them are also in different places with their own, uh, you know, anti-racism education, with their own backgrounds, uh, with their own knowledge. And again, you know, meetings like this, which I think are really important, are real opportunities for us all to come and hear from different people, different people's experiences. I mean, my experiences, um, you know, my background growing up in London, you know, the, the things that I've been through, the things that I've experienced are going to be different to even someone living half a mile down the road from me. And, you know, we, we are all part of the music landscape. We're all part of the music community. I think a lot of people do want to hear and want to be educated and want to change their minds and want to know the best way forward. So I think just really don't be afraid to be honest. Don't be afraid to say, no, what you're doing there isn't right. I know your heart's in the right place, but what you're doing is tokenistic. I well, think thank you. Thank you. Oh. I think one thing you'll find with the community, they are not shy to tell you they think you've got it wrong. So a little more interaction, but they'll yeah. treat you like family and say, look, sis, you've got it wrong. We want you to change this. Because I'll say I'd say that what you're doing is wonderful work, what we've heard tonight, but I understand if you say you don't you don't know who you're not representing. Maybe by talking to the wider stakeholders that uh, Kwaku mentioned, we will you'll get an idea of who isn't in your tent, as it were. So Absolutely. thank you very much for that, Jane. Is that your comment? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's a really uh, empireitis is certainly a term. I think I can. Take, I think we're back, all take back towards to the board. Um, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. It sounds like a joke, but it's I not know. a joke. It's a real thing. It's a no, real... Not for... Joan, I don't think she's taking it as a joke. She's saying it's an important term. It's a good expression. Absolutely. Um, and I think very helpful to remind uh, white people, including myself, in those positions that they have a responsibility to not ask black people to do all of the work. Um, a few really quick things just in response. Um, I think particularly post Blackout Tuesday, um, there was an awareness, our vice chair, the vice chair of our organization is a black man, Kwame Kwaten. And um, we had a lot of very open and honest and awkward and uncomfortable conversations about what the organization needs to be doing. Um, and out of that came an anti-racist program which we're running, um, MMF Unite. But one of the key things that I think was important to us was that couldn't be run by a team of five white staff and so we created a job role and we put it out to tender and we hired a black woman with strong existing connections in the live music sector because we couldn't in good faith uh, push forward running an entirely uh, a program focusing on anti-racism uh, and realized that we might be speaking to the right people and having I mean I don't think we can take all the right steps and mistakes get made, but really trying to be as open as possible. The other thing that we did was set up an anonymous um, survey to our members, inviting them to share their uh, expectations and experiences of us as an organization, and then also reach out to black managers that aren't a member of our organization and try and understand why they've never felt welcome or why they've never felt compelled to join up to this point. And I think that we've learned a lot from people being generous with very honest feedback and trying to build that into what we're doing next. Um, and on the point, I think of empireitis and leadership, being aware of what you need to do, uh, again, in positions of power. I mentioned the unconscious bias training that we're doing with the board, but I'm very, very aware that unconscious bias is an imperfect system. And the consultancy organization that, that's running it for us are putting a very strong emphasis on inclusive leadership. So it's not about them, it's not just about our board recognizing when they might be discriminating against someone, but actually putting the onus and the responsibility back onto them so that they can understand what their job is and what their role is in making our organization more inclusive. Um, I think we have a lot of mistrust and a lot of, um, you know, this, the organization that I work for historically was established in a very rock genre, it was very male, it was very white. And while we do, we are seeing a, a big shift in our membership and it's more diverse, we have a lot of work to do. And we have a lot of trust that we need to earn. Thank you so much for that. No, um, well, I'd like yeah. to come in. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Two things, especially since we've still got some presenters in the room. I think it's important that you talked about black staff. I talk about African staff. It's important that the African staff, or if you want to go as far as to say, and that's African, Asian, minority ethnics, they shouldn't be the default advisors on racism because there's a uh, presupposition that people who face racism know racism more. Some of us go through it without understanding that we're going through a, a, a racist culture. So the point I'm making is that it should be getting an expert who does racist anti-racism programs instead of the four. Oh, Kwame is in the group. Kwame, can you come and talk to us about racism or, or, or run a racist uh, program? So I, I thought I, 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 I will just throw that in. Can I just say, I know my, 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 my mate uh, Colin Brown is in the house and Colin did buy a P, P, uh, PRS license for us to be able to use music on, uh, what shall I say, what, Zoom. So just throwing that out. So Nana, please continue. Okay. Um, could I ask Judy, Sister Judy, is there a question you want to ask? I noticed you have been putting comments in the chat. If you want to summarize a question then, since we've got, Tom and G and Jane here, they might be able to throw some light on it. And we've got Paul, Paul who we met today, who might be able to talk about education. So if you want to ask a question, please unmute. A summary of some of the points you've been putting in the chat. Judy Richards. Oh, what a shame. She's probably not behind the microphone. Oh, she, no, yes, I, I am ahead. behind the mic. I'm just reluctant to... Oh, that's to fine. Just, if you don't want, I could always then, ask somebody else. Yeah. I mean, it's, if people are going to actually read the chat, I'd rather put it in the chat. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I thought you might, we might have the benefit of a live uh, interaction, but that's fine. We can leave it in the chat and then it can, we can come back. Then maybe I'll throw it out. Um, in the news... I think the past few days, there's been talk about making it, making schools. Again, this really, I know, Paul, you've just become one of us, but maybe Paul and then all the other presenters could come in on this. There's, there's been a talk about making um, teaching, you know, bringing teaching back to so-called, a bit like, uh, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, bring it back to what Trump has done, make America great again. So in a way, the subtext of what I'm hearing is, make Britain great again. And it, it's that kind of, that seems to be the talk. And in a sense, that seems to undermine all the good work you're doing. That is, we recognize that there have been some things that have been unequal, unhelpful, and frankly racist. And we're trying to address that. The director from government seems to be throwing a spanner in the works. How do uh, you respond to that? And I'll go to Paul first because you are producing educational materials for our schools. I think the, what comes from the DFE uh, is a very top-down and politicised viewpoint. What happens on the ground is a different thing, um, I think, and what we try to do is reflect what we believe in, which is a kind of, you know, a very uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural approach to education. And, and I hope that, and in the hope, and I think the hope is justified that teachers will want to do that. Um, and very often we do ignore what happens at the DFE just because of the politics involved. Um, and I, in the US, I, I can see Trump's kind of America is great campaign um, flying in the face of the American, um, the, all the progress that's been made with the American arts frameworks, which are very multicultural and accepting of that kind of, that uh, education is very important in promoting that. So I think we just do what's happening on the ground and we ignore the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of crazy um, directive approach. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for jumping in. And so can I go to Tom? You know, you've talked about your 10, your diversity report, mm. ten plan. how, because again, what happens in schools influences what comes out in music, et cetera. So how will that affect your way of thinking? And since music also and the arts, you drive change. How will you maybe counter that? Well, certainly. I mean, it's certainly, um, I think one of the points which was made earlier in the presentations from the, the representatives from the Musicians' Union was, union was this, this letter that they, they sent earlier in the summer as well, which was to the ABRSM, the Association Board of 
of, 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 of music and basically they're the awarding body um for for music and then uh, obviously the grade system is all kind of uh, put forward by them and that basically that letter was a letter of to basically shift their their syllabus away from what was a very white centric um uh, uh, syllabus of of composers and um that being the, the reference points so there's a there's a, almost a very institutional problem i think within the curriculum and curriculum learning that i think bodies such as musicians union uk music aim mmf are trying to to really support and uh, overcome the, the challenge that is that institutional problem there's a wider problem within our talent talent pipeline anyway but that is um is magnified, I think, in terms of diversity issues too, and it's um, particularly around around race and the quality of opportunity. And I think that's an area which we want to over, over, overcome uh, greatly as, as well as in that area. So I think if we can kind of break down, if we hit it at the core through things like awarding bodies and making sure that they actually providing a, a real uh, showcase of composers and uh, songwriters and have, putting their first and foremost at the uh, in, in the curriculum which is actually diverse and reflective and representative of of the population that is something which we are committed to to um to tackling oh thank you Tom. thank you very much for that uh jane do you, could you please add your perspective i think sure. she may have gone Oh, she's still there. Oh, no, I, I'm still Jane here. Oh, okay. Good. I thought I saw in the chat. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I'm just thinking about how that question uh, applies specifically to our organisation. But I suppose um, education amongst our members uh, for white managers who have not thought particularly uh, in depth about how they might be complicit or in racist, racist sort of institutions or structures or for our, our black, Asian or other ethnic background managers in terms of how they've been affected. Um, we've had a focus certainly in the last few weeks on trying to establish a bit of context. So our first Unite event, we had Tony Warner from Black History Walks and he joined us for um, an evening session to give us a little bit of context on British civil rights the formation of the 2010 Equalities Act and then contextualize that in the history of black musicians. So he spoke mm -hmm. about, um, you know, the composer and uh, violinist George Bridgewater, the civil rights activist, Dr. Harold Moody, um, Winifred Atwell, the Trinidadian pianist, and basically helping, helping everyone that came along really get a little bit of a context of the exploitation or the removal of, of black talent from history. Um, and we then went on to have quite an open discussion amongst our members, um, uh, pr pretty mixed attended, but, you know, about their experiences. So first event was to set some context and then the next event was specifically about racism in the live sector. The next one will be about um, black managing black talent. So if you have a white manager working with black talent or black manager working with white talent. So within that program, we're trying to have a focus on education, but more widely, we um, have we've decided to review our education programs. So previously we had a set um, provider for our education and training and we put it out to tender because we'd like to have more diverse teachers as well. So that we're not just teaching an old syllabus that's a bit stuffy and not representative of um, what the industry looks like now. So that's another thing. And then I think that point that Tom made about the talent pipeline and what the trade bodies are doing, working with education to make sure that you see young people pass through school into different kinds of education programs. And for us, that's really been through the accelerator program, which is a, a basically a bursary in training. Um, and in that process, it's very much not been about having any kind of qualifications. You just have to have an artist that's showing promise, that's at that tipping point. And then we're able to step in and offer some training and support and trying to have everybody included in that. Everybody involved, it's, it's been quite a diversely, uh, participants have been quite mixed Thank and you. that's been. Yeah, that oh, sounds great. Sorry, pardon me, I'm ranting now. No, 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 it's good because I think you, you've reminded us of some of the things that you're trying to do and how you and I think it's fascinating to hear how you're bringing African history into the mix because again it's when we are all educated that we will understand better how our world is shaped um, again, 
I'm sorry, once you finish, can I come in? Once you finish, can I come in, please? Yeah, I was going to say that we're running to 9.15, and I know the program was advertised 6 to 9, so there might be a few people who need to leave, and uh, I therefore I say feel free to, and uh, I need to actually take this moment to thank you all for being here, for being thank part you. of this exciting program to thank Park also for the work put in, and also the industry leaders for being here. For some of us who are not in the industry, it is fascinating to hear you talk, to hear you present, and to hear you shape, tell us how the music, what goes behind it, you know, what, how it, it fits together. So uh, Kwaku, I'll hand you the mic and okay. that. No, you're doing a good job, but uh, uh, I'm glad you talked about the African history aspect. Jane, I'm not being patronizing, but I just had to say what I'm about to say. I was at the, the presentation given by Tony Warner, and it was obvious that most of the audience hadn't heard any of the stuff that happened. So this is kudos to you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that subsequent to that, you rattling off names like Winifred Atwell and uh, Dr. Moody and stuff. So uh, what I want to say is that that is a way forward. So at least from that program, Europeans are getting to have a handle on some of what I call British Afghan history. So that is fantastic. And I'm hoping that we're going to have more of those sessions to move forward. I'm going to corrupt and uh, paraphrase what was the name. Oh, Dr. Angela Davis. She says, it's not enough to say, remember I'm paraphrasing, I'm terrible with quotes. That's why I edited a book called African Voices, Quotations by People of African Descent, because I forget the quotes, but at least I put that in the book. So I think, um, she, what, what's her name? Angela Davis said, it's not enough to be anti-racist, uh, no, non-racist. You have to be proactively anti-racist. So uh, being proactive means being active about it instead of just going with the flow and saying, oh, no, I'm not racist. So I think that's something that needs to be repeated in order to speak to the work that people are doing in any uh, organ organization. Will, I'm very glad that uh, you still with us. I'm not quite sure this our first uh, presentation or what should I say, event that you've been to. So as a uh, unionist, and I know your remit at the TUC is about race. Can you comment on what you've heard thus far? I know you've made the comment earlier on, but we've spoken since. So maybe you can come back from any angle to add to the conversation this late. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I mean, I'd say two things. One is that, um, that actually, as well as people thinking about what their anti-racist programs are, they need to um, think about how they're going to sustain those uh, because you know um, you know we saw a lot of activity after the, the Stephen Lawrence inquiry and actually that fell away in fact it well it fell away so badly that actually you couldn't talk about race anymore and actually to raise race often people who raised race uh, got attacked um, um, I mean and I think secondly I mean I think for me also it's about people thinking about how they transform their their organizations one of the things for me about the music industry and what i talked a bit about, i made a reference to Ofcom, and it, it it speaks to what nana was saying earlier about the system that we live in is that the industry uh, we all have to recognize is very exploitative um and and as as an industry it's there it makes huge profits and it addresses uh, what those areas where it thinks it can make profits and often uh, black people end up on the margins of that um, so you know one of the things for me especially I think uh, in relation to what's happened to the pandemic everybody has to think about in terms of the industry and the activities uh, that they're, they're, they're involved in is who do they serve and make sure that when they're thinking about their anti-racist programs thinking about actually um, so the, not just not just including black people in the workplace and not just thinking about their experience once they're in the workplace, but also actually what it is their industry is doing and who it serves. Because actually, you know, if, if it's continued to be run on the basis which is just highly exploitative, um, then actually ultimately the dynamics in the system mean that things will not change. 
Um, so I think we have to think about these things in a far wider way than um, just about how do we um, improve the experience of some individuals that just happen to be working in that industry. James, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Actually, can, I, can I ask a question? Because I, I, th I think it's yeah. better for someone like me to be in, in listening mode rather than speaking. Okay. I'm, I'm curious to know what people feel around um, the, the extent to which the solution to many of the issues is, is around um, um, opportunity and, and you know, the, the, effectively the lack, of, the lack of financial opportunity. Because I, I suspect a lot of these problems do come from racism, but also come from poverty and poverty of opportunity. And so what can an organisation like Help Missions be doing in order to make its money that it gives out really have traction and really have the the kind of the best uh, chance of um, of kind of leveling a playing field. <laughs> well, our organisation doesn't work on no funding at all, but obviously it's not a sustainable thing. Uh, people, I love the when David said the next one, uh, presupposing that we're in a position to do the next one. Uh, it may be Zoom, but there's a cost to all all all, all these things, both financial and and, and, and time wise. So uh, probably you go look at those that are uh, out there. So that means mapping mapping out, as I said, your your the communities and seeing who can add to what you're doing, but are not necessarily in the, in the, in the, in the, in the great position because there's a limit, I'm aware of the limit to which our voices are heard. I'll tell you something I was most disappointed and I hope that I, I, I'm proven wrong, that I sent this thing out a couple of weeks. I thought it needed to be music week. We sent the press release to music week and the, the week after um, Black Out Tuesday, there are so many races in programs. So now I'm saying, is this just a moment? How can we be doing something where we've engaged about 10 music industry organizations and because we're a small organization, it's not deemed worthy to be run. I'm sure if it was help musicians or any organization that's on their radar, they will run it. And I'm most disappointed. That's our trade, trade newspaper. This was a trade stroke community uh, uh, event, and I think it needed to be in there. I've had a good uh, support from, from the industry, but for our trade newspaper to not even put it online, I hope maybe they did something and I didn't see it. In that case, I'm, I'm happy to apologize. But it's that type of thing, that disrespect and disengagement and not seeing beyond people's noses because, oh, we've got BPI, we've got MMF, we're done. There's that organization that could actually give you some advice that you're not know, aware of because they're not on your radar. So I think you, just like I quoted Angela Davis saying you have to be proactive, you have to be proactive in seeking potential partners. It's nice having mobile awards. They are on the radar, they're big, but I'm sure there are organizations capable of doing good work that are off the radar. So I think one of the challenges, especially for the presenters in the room, is please be proactive in seeking potential partners from the communities you know you're not engaging with. Don't wait for us. I came to you guys, but don't wait for them because some people don't have the confidence. I know what Nana said about us. We'll let you hear. No, most times we, we chat amongst ourselves. We waste our energy chatting amongst ourselves and doesn't go to who needs to, to, to hear it. So I'm putting the onus on you to not you or James, but any organization head to actually make an effort to look at their wider uh, stakeholders, particularly guys that haven't come on board. It's nice one of your presenters say, talk to us, talk to us. But if they don't know you, it's a bit difficult. So you also, let, let it be a two-way street. I'm going to cut, cut short what I'm saying. Let it be a two-way street. You guys have also got outreach. It might mean getting some specialist people, just like you have a specialist mailing list, getting some specialist organizations. Like, these are the guys to talk to. These are the guys to talk to, to point you in the right direction. Or else it will be the same old, same old, and you get what you call uh, group think. And my idea is that I want to mitigate groupthink by getting people that are not necessarily in the music business, they're not making their money from music business, but they're part of the stakeholder community. That's me, Dan, Nana. Sorry, can I jump in, Kweku? Go ahead, 
Mr. Colin, who, by the way, can I just say, Colin works with me. We do the international record. We work on a number of, of, of projects. So he's been quiet, but he feels he must talk, and I think he ought to. Go ahead, Colin. Well, no, a question was asked, so I want to answer that question. Um, yeah, so Reggae Fraternity UK, we reached out to a number of organisations last year. So we reached out to the PRS. So we have a good relationship with the PRS now. In fact, the great PRS have offered us money um, and to work with us. And, and COVID's kind of scuppered um, a program, that, uh, a series of workshops that we were going to have with the PRS. So that's, I'm, RFUK seeks to be the, 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 the conduit, you know, the interface with the, with the UK reggae community. So we reached out to the PRS and, you know, we have, yeah, we've got a good relationship with the PRS. So 2019, we had a, a couple of meetings with the PRS. Um, also reached out to the Musicians' Union. Again, very good dialogue with the Musicians' Union. Um, and uh, again, the Musicians' Union, uh, we, we, in fact, we've aligned our, our process and procedures with the Musicians' Union. So embracing their diversity and everything. So we, we were, we were well aligned and we've adopted um, a lot of the policies that the MU, the MU have got. Um, so, yeah, so we've reached out to the MU, so we're working with the MU, um, and we reached out to PPO. Unfortunately, the, 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 the contact I had with the PPO, that, that worked, and then the person disappeared, and then somehow the, the engagement has stopped. But, it's again, it's just trying to engage with organisations. I think perhaps if Kwaku shares, well, he, he is going to share um, the contacts and the organisations that we represent. So perhaps, you know, we, and I am familiar with all these organ, all the organizations that are presented today, but we don't have, we haven't had FaceTime with you all. So now that you know we're in existence and our, our, our aim as an organization is, is to represent the UK reggae community, um, perhaps like Quaker said, reach out to us. I mean, you know, <laughs> okay. mention, mention, can I just speak about the MOBOs? You said you've got a relationship with the MOBOs. Well, from the reggae community's perspective, there isn't a good relationship with the MOBOs. So, you know, it is, you need to know who, you, who you're in partnership for and who they, who they speak for. Um, the MOBOs, we've tried to reach out and speak to the MOBOs and we offered to work with the MOBOs and haven't had much success with the MOBOs. I know they took a year out and unfortunately because of COVID, it's like two years out or they took a, an extra year out and they, they were going to jump on the um, Brent Borough of Culture program and we're going to relaunch this year instead of the previous year. But you know, it's just understanding which organisations which organizations you're partnering and what which constituency they represent. The MOBOs don't represent us. We try to partner with the MOBOs to say that the reggae community is underrepresented by the MOBOs. Okay. Can mm -hmm. I just jump in and also plug what we do and I work with Colin there. Uh, I do the coordination for International Reggae Day, which is our uh, 1st July. So we do have a reggae, what should I say, collective, a reggae collective uh, built around uh, working towards International Reggae Day UK, by the way, it's international, but we focus on the UK. So that's just something to throw in. Um, I've already thanked everybody, but I think I'll share a Banksy uh, analogy with everybody that racism is like you're downstairs and there's a leak coming from your neighbor's um, house or the flat above, and you keep on mopping, the more you mop, the more the water comes in. Well, it is incumbent on the neighbor to realize that the neighbor downstairs is not gonna tolerate that nonsense forever. So if you don't deal with the leak, which is affecting the neighbors downstairs, one day your neighbor, downstairs neighbor will come and kick your door in and deal with you. And it's a, quite a graphic, um, representation of racism and i'm saying that i was reminded of that because of something in the chat reminding us that racism is profitable racism itself came about and that's what we tend to forget it came about as part of um the capitalist exploitation of labor so if once we understand that dismantling it means we need to replace it with what we know is better and i thank you all for the goodwill for the um, wanting to make a difference. But I'm also reminded of what my 
26 year old daughter told me because some of her friends for the very first time were going on a demonstration and this was because of George Floyd and her um, uh, placard read after this demo I'll still be black and it's that you know that for some it was their very first demonstration they were excited oh have you faced racism those were the questions she was getting from her European uh, friends and she's been friends with them for years and it makes me wonder how come they don't know that she lives with it but that is for us to know and therefore I do thank the music industry for Blackout Tuesday the fact that people are stepping out is brilliant but the community and, and Kwaku, I, what I'm saying about people won't be shy to speak up. I say, if when we are a room together and we know we are free to speak, people will speak their mind. And it's about creating those space, safe, safe spaces for us to exchange and talk and, and sort of and reason together because it's by reasoning together that change comes. So I need to thank you all very much. It's 9.31. So the meeting is officially closed. And those who wish to stay and reason, Kwaku said he'll keep the room open. Yeah, so, yeah. God so bless thank you, you very much, everyone. Thank you to Nana. Thank you to everyone that contributed. I know Marcus wants to speak. So, uh, okay, Marcus, uh, let's be, uh, what should I say, succinct. I think that is a byword. I'm not, um, I'm not bashful in guillotine people. So let's be succinct and that's, Fine. So go ahead, Marcus. Just wanted to ask um, Colin. Colin made some very good points. Um, I wanted to ask Colin what, um, in his own opinion, when, when did he think the MOBOs went bad, um, if, if, if that's the case, and, uh, you know, what caused that in terms of reggae in, in, in the MOBOs? I have a similar view, but I'd be very interested to hear what Colin has to say on that. Okay, you can respond, Colin. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. <coughs> did, so did yeah, you sorry. Yeah, I, I, what, what, what I did to engage with um, Kanya um, was just basically look at, um, from a reggae perspective, yeah. just look to see um, the awards over the years from the, hit, from the, from the beginning of the, the MOBOs and yeah. just to see how many UK artists have been recognised. Mm -hmm. And yes, the very first person to be recognised was Peter Honeygale. Peter Honeygale. And that's great. Um, but after, you know, after that, well, I think it was two or three um, after that were UK. And then it just focused on Jamaica. Um, and then the, the, the actually the, the, the reggae community switched off of the MOBOs because it didn't represent them uh, over a number of years. So when we hear, oh, the MOBOs are coming up, why, why are we getting interested? We're never going to see any of our people on there. Yeah. Um, there was a tie, uh, there was an artist called Finley Quay um, yeah. that was that was put up by the industry. We never heard reggae community, you know, mm -hmm. the core, the, 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 the core yeah. of the reggae community weren't familiar with Finley Quay's um, work, but that was the industry um, who funded someone and, and put the in, and, and put that that artist up, and it just yeah. seemed to get more and more corporate. And that, yeah. the, the more corporate it, it, it got, as the more it lost its roots. Yeah. Um, that's you know, and that's happened over a period of time. With the, I think it was Mastercard was the was the, the the relationship, and then it moved. Then in order to, to 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 keep going, she then moved. You know, did the, the road trip where she moved to Scott, took it Scotland. to Scotland, and yeah. various other places. I mean, just I mean, I applaud um, Kanye for for keeping it going for so. It's, awards are not easy, so I, yeah. I don't I don't underestimate the challenge she faces annually. And I, and I, and I, have got nothing but praise for what she's done, but that's why we, when we, when we, when we contacted the MOBOs uh, last year, I think it was last year, um, it was with love. It, you know, it was to say, look, we recognize how difficult it is to host an award every year, but we want to partner. We want to help you to engage with the, with the UK reggae community and work with us. And so we gave, you know, an A4 summary of, of what we, what, you know, of basically um, what we, well, basically we, we listed how the awards have been issued over the past, well, since it's, since it's, since it's inception. Yeah. And then we just gave some, 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 some feedback as to how, how we could help the awards. So it was, it was, it was to, 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 really enhance it and get more engagement 
from the yeah. UK UK reggae community that basically if you say Momobo's awards are coming up to anyone in the UK reggae industry like no, Momobo, what, yeah. so what, yeah. what does that mean to me it doesn't mean I don't see any we never get invited um, we're not part of the voting we're not part of anything yeah not to mention what it, not to mention what it um it, it 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 did it does for the singers and the artists themselves the reggae artists themselves i mean it it, it doesn't uh, encourage there to be any reggae artists uh, from the uk like dj's or singers that type of thing because there's no one around to say well look you could win a mobo for this you see because it's not featured so i take your point well, one 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 of the interesting things would you believe Max, maxi priest has not received an award a mobo International artist. International artist. Maxi Priest was the first, is the, well, it's Mac, Maxi Priest and UB40. Yeah. Are the only UK reggae acts to have um, got to number one on the Billboard charts. So charts. That's not reggae charts. That's, that's right. The bill, that's the Billboard yes. pop charts. I know. So those are the sorts of things. Steel Pulse, not got a MOBO. Steel Pulse are the first UK um, reggae band or were the first non-Jamaican band yeah. to receive a Grammy, a Grammy award. Yeah. So those are the sorts of things that are put to Kenya. And, and you know, it's like with Soul to Soul, when you look on the Soul side, Soul to Soul had never received uh, a Brit award, but they got, they got recognized in America. So the same thing was happening with the, with the, um, with the Mobos, not recognizing or, or stop looking at what was happening in the UK and so we just felt that the UK reggae community just felt disenfranchised and just didn't engage with it. It's not an, it's not an award ceremony that, mean, that meant anything or means anything. Okay. Yeah. Let me, <laughs> thanks a lot to Marcus and Colin. I want to move the conversation forward. So I want to jump in and I'll do this, speak on people I know or let other people contribute. But uh, Empress Lee, you've been quiet. I know you, uh, you, you do promote with uh, Ray Carlos and staff. So uh, I believe you, you are an artist, probably on, on the jazz tape, or but certainly involved in reggae. So do you want to get the microphone and speak to any point? Not, it, didn't, it need not be about reggae, but you've been here for quite a while. So if you're behind your microphone, do you want to unmute and contribute? If not, I will move on to someone else in the room. Okay. Uh, it's a shame because I know she, she does a lot of work uh, with Ray Carla. So there you go. Uh, John, you you waving, so I, I take you want to make a, 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 co a comment, go ahead. No, I, I was just waving at Jane because she was going, but I can make a comment if you want. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to, uh, uh, James asked a, quish, a question earlier about how to, he, he asked a question, he, which was the first, you know, what can I, what can I do? And that was the that was just what I want, wanted to respond to, which was asking the question: What do you need? What do you want? And yes, there is poverty and there's economic problems, but it's asking what do you want. A, good, a crude example is if you ask a lot of bames if they want to be called bame, they'll probably say no. That's so. We are not just a batch of things that you apply a strategy to we're, we're human we're real we and every single one of us whatever sh color shade we are we're all entirely different stop looking at uh, at us as a batch of people that needs to be fixed and and um shoveled into the situation so it works and it's also about looking inward Jane so it's really lovely all the things you're doing but you actually need to have a chat with yourself and ask yourself why it took things like George Floyd for companies suddenly to do something it shouldn't take George Floyd this has been going on for hundreds of years why did it take this long for people to choose to do something because the choice was always there why is it that people in power chose not to? And, and, that, and the first way to helping that problem is, James, for you to ask people who it's happening to, which you're doing now, but it's also about asking yourself why you didn't do it earlier. What's the real answer? But it's very sweet of you what you're doing now, but the answer's already within you. 
So, James, you've been asked a direct question. So, are you in a position to answer? Uh, yes, I, Joan, I was about to leave and then I, I heard you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I hung up to listen. Um, no, I, I think you're, you're quite right. I mean, um, and I think when you say, yeah, I, I need to ask the question of myself, I think you say yeah, asking the question of myself and, and of my organisation, you know, as an employer and as a, as, a, as a charity that's been there for 99 years so far. And you're know, trying to look at what, what the charity has done and what it's failed to do and, and what it can do going forwards. Um, but I think, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's important to, to ask the question of, of as many people as possible, because I, I totally agree, everybody is individual. And, um, you know, you, you can't, you, you know, no one can be kind of just put into a group or categorised or have a programme applied at them. And that's why for us, you know, for me in particular, and for us at Help Musicians, this, this really is about, I, I think our best contribution is around providing uh, opportunity on an individual basis. You know, all the work we do is, is intended to have a kind of one-to-one -one relationship with musicians. And, and so the, the key thing for us is to make sure that no musician is den denied that, no musician doesn't hear about our work, and no musician has a problem applying for it. Uh, because of their, their the colour of their skin or or any other uh, discriminatory tendency, so yeah, a, a lot for us to do and a lot for us still to learn. But I, I appreciate the spirit of your reply, and it was very helpful. We look after professional musicians from the age of eighteen right up until end of life, and so yeah, we um, uh, we we provide um, funding for um, creative projects. We do visiting of isolated musicians uh, and all sorts in between. And um, so in terms of calling people in your network, I think the starting point is that they should be looking at our website and getting in touch. We're, we're not a membership organization, we're a charity. So in other mm -hmm. words, you don't have to be a member or to have paid anything in order to receive anything from us. Okay. Uh, we're a charity that does it um, because that's, that's, our, that's our work. And we're funded by music lovers who want to see us help as many musicians as possible. Okay. Um, Obviously, we, we, can't, we can't fund everything for any, everybody who applies because that would become um, an impossible task. Um, so we have various uh, um, kind of criteria on, on the work that we focus on, but we, we do help people, particularly you know, end of life and, and in isolation. Um, and if any of your members are struggling in that respect, they, they really ought to get in touch. We have a casework team, so they, they will ring up and they will talk to a human being. Um, and, and it all starts there with a one-on-one with a, a -on -one relationship. Thank <laughs> you.